I, um, again, I'm, I'm very lucky that this weekend to have uh, my children and my wife here. And uh, one of the comments that I commonly make to my children is never understate the benefit of serendipity. Um, a surgeon I, I trained with at, at, at the Cleveland Clinic was a neurosurgeon named Joe Hahn. He was chief of uh, neurosurgery and he was also chair of the division. And he would constantly say, it's, it's better to be lucky than good. And in, in many ways, my, my next speech, speaker really embodies that. Um, I, I consider myself to be just an extraordinarily lucky person. And meeting Kurt Cronin was, was part of that good luck in, in my life. I have a friend, Lindsay, who's in the financial services business in New York. And one day there was this random email that said, the two of you get to, need to get to meet each other and get to know each other better. And so we had talked on, on the phone a couple of times, traded some emails, and uh, one day he said, I'll be uh, traveling to New York. Um, why don't we get together? And so uh, we, we actually met at the Four Seasons. We sat in the pool room, and we talked for about two and a half or three hours. They, they literally were re ready to, to close the uh, facility uh, when we had uh, finished up uh, lunch. Um, I think it's one of the really neat things about this conference is that we get to hear from our colleagues who have developed tremendous expertise, but we also get to hear from leaders in, in, in other fields. And again, I, I, I won't, I won't la labor by working through Kurt's introduction by, uh, by bibliography or CV, but a truly extraordinary individual. Uh, Kurt is a member of the U.S. Marines. Um, he was the, one of the team leaders for SEAL Team 6. As many of you will know, uh, that was the team that ultimately uh, carried out the, the Osama bin Laden operation. He had left that team approximately six months prior to that operation, but the, 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 ext the extraordinary proudness of hi him and his team is always evident. He doesn't talk about it readily. It's not something that he will open a conversation with, something that you need to, to, to understand and get to know him before he'll talk about it. Moreover, he has this tremendous remorse and, and, and almost survival guilt over the fact that a significant component of his team was lost uh, literally six weeks after the bin Laden operation uh, in which um, they were doing another operation in Afghanistan and during he helicopter uh, crash, many of those individuals uh, perished. He, uh, after leaving the Marines, uh, went on to, to join uh, General McChrystal, and McChrystal and Associates was one of his partners, and has subsequently left that to, to create a, a new de, uh, endeavor. Uh, he has a tremendous portfolio in the business world. He works with everyone from IBM uh, to the um, Miami Dolphins. Uh, he is just a, an extraordinary individual. Again, if you read the biography, it will talk about some of the transformational impact that he had upon how we look at warfare in the Middle East and has actually had a major role in the strategic alliances. But again, it's, it, what's so fascinating about that to me is that he has taken technology and it is, is his tremendous personal energy, positivity, and intellectual pursuit that really capitalizes and leverages that, um, th 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 those resources. So um, with uh, no further ado, I would uh, like to invite uh, Kurt Cronin uh, to our address our conference. Kurt. Good morning. It's absolutely an awesome honor and privilege to be here. When Dennis first gave me the call and said, hey, you know, can you come to this, this uh, speak at this symposium? I got off the phone. I was all excited. I told my wife, did you ever think in your wildest dreams I get to speak for the greatest head and neck surgeons in the world? And she said, well, honey, to be honest, you're not in my wildest dreams. <laughs> so although I'm, I'm ecstatic to be here, I'm also humble. You know, you may be wondering why is a Navy SEAL going to talk to us here at this conference? And one of the things that is the foundational principle of the SEALs is servant leadership. And to me, there's no greater service than the service you do to help people you know, get their lives back from a situation they never could have anticipated. And the second component, the reason it makes tag to be at this conference is the second foundation of the SEALs is innovation. 
every single day you have to evolve to be faster than the enemy because at the, end, the instant you're behind them, you get killed. And so with that servant leadership orientation, that innovation, I think it's, it's awesome to be here. And my mission in the next 30 minutes is to provide some of the principles we learned in combat that I think are very relevant to the ones that you're dealing with today. And obviously I'm in a very different uniform today than the one I used to wear. So I'm going to show you a quick 90 second clip of, of some of the things we used to wear. But one of the things here is you're going to see a variety of insertion, a variety of extraction platforms. The key for us is you're going to see the, the overarching concept is this is a hostage rescue mission. You give people lives back every day in the, in the OR. Our passion is to do that through hostage rescue. Someone's life is being taken from them against their will. And you'll see we're very good at going in quietly, and we tend to go out very noisily. So, so you'll see the quiet insertion and then the, the uh, hasty extraction, and then we'll continue. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to the boys. Secure. This is a personnel recovery. Proceed to target. Recover the package and move to extract. Got it. Target secure. Man, I'm taking you home. For all those who've been down range, it's us. And those like us, damn few. I have positive control of the Raven. We have enemy QRF approaching from the north. This thing is way bigger than we thought it was. They're gonna hit us at home. Hey boys, we gotta roll! Just for a minute. on the ground. Be safe. How can you stop this? I can't. You live your life by a code. It's your shoreline. It's what guides you home. And trust me, you're always trying to get home. I love opening with that clip because you know, everyone loves to fly off into the sunset after a great operation, after a huge success, after the end of the year where the hospitals perform well. And we believe the population of Navy SEALs goes up about 400% on Friday nights at the bar. Right? Infinitely more likely that there's more Navy SEALs. And everybody wants to be part of the win. But that wasn't the SEAL community that I joined. This is the community that I joined. I took the oath of office in 1998 to defend the nation against all threats, foreign and domestic. And three years later, we suffered abject failure. And we had that abject failure. 3,000 US international citizens lost their lives that day, not because we didn't know that the enemy declared war on us. They'd actually declared war on us years earlier. It's because we didn't listen. And the reason I'm so ecstatic that people are at conferences like you are today, because you're on the proactive side of infinity. You're on the front edge looking out to see what can we solve. We were on the reactive side of infinity. Reactive side, action happened, and then we had to spend all this time to catch, catch up. And oftentimes in today's advanced world, you can't. Because you've been in these situations, right, where the organizations and your learning curve, you start in the medical profession, you learn really quickly, right? But then the challenge is, what happens? It starts to level off. And the world, as you know, continues to change at an ever-increasing pace. And so the moment that the world starts to change more rapidly than your organization, the technology, your disease moves faster than you are, then you start to have that gap, the gap between where you are and where you have to be. The only way I believe you can ever fill that gap is by building an unbeatable team. See, the world now is way too complex for any one individual to have mastery of everything. Here's the secret. Navy SEALs are not good by design. We're good by default. If you think about in the 1700s, if you left it, went out to sea, you weren't going to see your boss for the next six months to a year whenever the ship came back. And so we had to work in decentralized environments where you got a band of excellence. Don't do this, don't do that, everything else you can. 
And we work in the water, so we happen to work in teams. So into the information age, and all of a sudden we're working decentralized teams very quickly. It allows us to adapt and evolve more rapidly than the enemy can. Right? Because here's the SEAL teams that I experienced when I first joined. Right? We were absolutely world class and we're unbelievably successful. If you ever want to know how important a Navy SEAL is, just ask us, we will tell you. Right? And because of that, it made us incredibly matrixed and siloed, and it made us unbelievably travel. Why would I talk to anybody that wasn't a Navy SEAL? Because they haven't gone through the same training we have. But here was the challenge we ran up against. Our challenge was the world had changed. If this inner circle represents the capability we had, the outer red dotted line circle represents the capability the world now required of us. See, we were great in Vietnam. We could walk from our base to the target, go to the target, come back, and do it all ourselves. And all of a sudden, we need helicopters to get there. We need the CIA and the intelligence to tell us where to go. We need the State Department's mission to be able to launch the operation. We had to have partnerships with the Iraqis, the Yemenis, the Afghanis, whatever country we were in. And all of a sudden, the capability far exceeded that which we had. So what do you do? When you come to a conference like this, you slap hands, and everybody's a team, right? Are you experienced? No, because we weren't in command of any of those resources. I don't have any of the control over their resources, their incentives. And so if you think about it, we didn't even need an enemy because we were absolutely diametrically opposed. I got paid to blow things up. The CIA got paid to build networks. And every time I blew up, their net, blew up, that, up that piece of that network, they lost out. So the State Department had 80-year plan for peace. So we were diametrically opposed internally which meant we had this 96-hour planning cycle after 2001's first attack. We shorted, over two years, we got that down to 48 hours, which is awesome, right? Twice as fast as it's ever been before, but that was in state-to-state -state warfare. And so now, we're twice as fast, but the enemy's decision cycle is now four hours. And so the president asked us, why aren't we doing more operations? And we said, sir, it would have been over six to 10 times before we launched. Because the world had changed, and we had, we'd, we'd missed it. And so the only thing we could do, we had to do the hardest thing for Navy SEALs to do. We had to swallow our ego, and we had to lead by influence. And when we transitioned and learned, learned to lead by influence, that's when we became that unbeatable team. And we went, here's your metric, we went from 18 raids in a month working about 20 hours a day into 300 raids a month working about 16 hours a day. We went from less than one a night into 10 per night. So now we could spiral all the way up in one cycle of darkness the, uh, you know, from the bottom of the chain all the way to the top. So if you're in this room, likely you don't need to do more. You're already working as hard as you can. I'm married to a physician. I, I understand your work ethic. But we're asking you to become more. How do you get to the point where the people with the greatest capability are the ones that are doing every single task so you can work at optimal efficiency and get that 15x increase because you're racing against disease. You're racing against the ability to integrate all the technologies evolving at the same time the disease is evolving. And how do you work against both those? It's only by working together as a group. Because people always ask, what's the most exciting thing you ever did in the SEAL to me? Was it jumping out of an aircraft at 25,000 feet, flying toward the target? Or was it diving under a ship? This is the most exciting piece. The reason is because when you're in the desert and the rotors spin up, the sand is actually harder than the outside of the rotor. So as you go toward the helicopter, it's pitch black at night, and you get this little ring of static electricity right, running right around the outside. You know, when you're going, you can barely talk to anybody, it's woof, 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 big windy, and as you get on board the helicopter, you just look straight across the helicopter. Of course, you can't say anything, but you look straight at your buddy, and you to move your night vision, and you give a quick head nod. And the head nod means my life and yours and yours and mine. And when the team is that integrated, when you see those 10 helicopters lift and simultaneously fly off in the darkness, you know that every single night people would say, Kurt, can you take on anything that comes your way tonight? I would say, absolutely. I'd say, do you have any idea how? They have no idea. Because much like the presentation you just saw, the plan never survives first contact, but the team's unity does. And as you landed and you should patrol toward the target and the terrain opened, whoosh, the entire team would open. And it closed, whoosh, it would close. And every single person in that patrol knew that the moment they need to act, they could act and they get the complete support of every other person on that team. And that's the part that changed the game. So as you talk today about driving technology and innovation and innovating your space, you know, my passion is, hey, how do you do that? The fun thing is, if you're here, you've likely done all three of these things. The question is, what's the habit and what's the discipline by which you've done them? Right? So what are the three requirements for what we call centered leadership, that limbic leadership that's completely aligned? Three easy components. First, 
You have to see things as they are. Right? Take full responsibility for, how, for the current reality and where you are right now. Second, see things for how they can be. And my favorite part about humans, think about we're the only creature on the planet that doesn't just react to what happens to them. We're the only ones that can look out into the future, create a vision, and communicate it to others. And that's why we want to define the future with power and purpose, almost completely aligned with the four principles you just saw Ashok fin finished with. And that if you define that purpose, power is energy moving freely toward purpose. And then the third part, the thing that puts you in the 0.01% that's in this room, because the first two phases, if you think about it, see things as they are, see things as they hang, can be, that's called a wish. The third critical piece is make things as they see them, right? Adapt with Kaizen, we call our company that because change for the good, adapt every single day, incremental improvement to manifest your vision, to bring that vision into reality. So I know it's early, I know it's you know, kicking off the conference, so today we thought we'd get everyone out of their seats and, and let you drive this live. So now if I can ask everyone to stand up, please. I'd like you to stand, keep your feet rooted to the floor, facing right toward the screen, and then safety profile of this. If there is a human in your way, as you turn, you're just going to lift your arm, and then you'll bring it back down afterwards. So, so I just want you to turn as far as you possibly can, feet planted, and just kind of make a mental note on the wall wherever your arm stops. So if there's someone in the way, just lift up your arm keep, and keep turning around. Kind of go as far as you possibly can and just make a kind of note how far you went and stop. Okay, so now arms down. Now we have a lot of achievers in the room, so then you're to take no physical motion now, but I'm gonna ask you to just close your eyes. And now I'd like to imagine doing the exact same thing you did, but imagine going 20 degrees further. If you've done that, I'd like you to imagine now that you go all the way around. And now finally, I'd like you to imagine you're an owl and you go all the way around and halfway again. So if you can open your eyes now, I'd like you to do the same thing you did the first time and just now turn as far as you possibly can and kind of make a note as to where your hand ended up relative to your very first time. Sir, what was your experience? A bit more? Now, did anybody change body types during the presentation? No, but you just did all three steps we talked about, right? I simply asked, hey, go as far as you think you can. You went so far. I asked you to imagine a future, which is the definition of what you're doing here for the next four and a half days. Um, you're going to sit down together as collective. A mind expanded by imagination never resumes its original dimensions. And then the third, you're going to take this back into your life and drive it into reality, right? Nothing, you know, as Dennis talked to me about and everyone has laid out, this is life-saving, life life-threatening events. None of this is very fairy. Everything's to drive an outcome. This is where you get to drive the results that you, that you envision. So if everyone could please sit down. Thank you very much. So let's talk about it now. See things as they are. You saw the one video clip. This is exactly what it looks like when you jump out of the back of an airplane with the big screen like this. It's just like jumping into a big screen TV. The interesting thing about when you jump out of a plane is you tend to think, ah, this is scary, this is a life-changing event, right? It's very much like raising my two-year-old daughter. Every single day she tries to commit suicide and I try and save her life, right? And so, you know, you jump out of a plane, I've now taken my own life, have to keep an even ratio of times I saved my own life. And so the first time I jumped out of a plane, you think, wow, this is serious, and so I got rigid. Now the interesting thing is if I'm rigid, I'm like a potato chip, I'm an unstable platform, an unstable platform if I fall onto my back and open my parachute on my back, you're guaranteed to die. You're completely covered in your shrouds. Same thing if you're diving under a ship. If I'm 66 feet under the surface, I'm at four ATAs of pressure, and I lose my air source, what's emotion tell us? <gasps> Take a breath and hold it. But if I go to the surface while holding my breath with compressed air, my lungs will explode. So as you get into those ORs, as you get into tight situations, into sensitive meetings, you get to choose how you're going to use that emotion, energy in motion. One of my best friends is a coach for some, a couple of country western singers, and the first one, she said, I, I can't go on stage, I'm getting nervous breakdown. I said, well, how do you know? She said, my chest gets tight, my palms get sweaty. And he was doing the same with Bruce Springsteen two weeks ago. He goes, how do you know you're in a peak state ready to rock? Oh, my chest gets tight, my palm gets sweaty. Right? So you get to decide how you're going to use that energy. We're all going to have those responses. How do you want to drive that? You know, this is a picture of me back in the days I had hair. I love offense. Right? I love getting to pick the moment, that, and I never fight fair. 
the whole point of this conference, right? You never want to fight fair against the disease you're going up with. You know, every time I went after a bad guy, I would take 150 of the best soldiers in the world. I would take aircraft stacked from 12 to 28,000 feet because I want to make sure we get the outcome we want. And so I trained for five years for offense. And 60 days into my first deployment, my CEO came and said, Kurt, congratulations, you're on defense. This is the president of Iraq. We're sending up the Iraqi government. If they get blown up, we don't have any replacements. So I want you to protect them for the next six months. Now, I'd love to tell you I was proactive and jumped into change like you are in this conference. But instead, I said, oh, time out. Sir, I don't do defense. SEALs don't do defense. I didn't select defense. I don't get to now pick the one moment that wins. And now I have to go for six months where if they ever have one moment of weakness, they win. So I started out in that victim consciousness. And I shifted and I said, okay, now I have to now become proactive. And I went to the achiever consciousness. I gave up blame. And I said, I'm going to take this on. And many of you in the surgical field, you, you have no problem taking this on. I'm, I'm the god of my OR. I'll take it on. The challenge I ran into here was I was now making decisions 20 hours a day. And it got to the point where I couldn't make any decisions. And so a great friend of mine, Forrest Kroll, came to me and said, Kurt, do you have a minute? I said, no, I'm busy. I said, well, I'm going to take a minute. It was about 2 in the morning. He said, I love you like a brother, but you're going to get us all killed. You can't do it all. You've got 149 people frustrated here doing nothing because you're not giving up control. So I had to do the hardest thing for Achiever. I had to give up that control and shift to the through me consciousness, right? I'm now copper wire. I'm now absorbed in the transaction. I said, Forrest, you've got point. Rock and roll took rear. We alternated days for security amounts, and all of a sudden, our performance exploded. Because I'd given up control, and now I had infinite capacity for everyone to do the thing that they were the best in the world at. If you have one component you take out today, this is the one I would bring with you, right? Humans are amazing fact or story-making machines, right? Every single day, there's a story that happens, or the fact that happens, and then there's a story we make up about it. Sunset happens, and we make it's either good sunset or bad sunset. Patient walks in, it's either good patient, bad patient. Right? The challenge becomes to organizations, I have my fact, I have my story, and when I collapse those, those become my truth. They're not the truth, but they're my truth. And this is where most dysfunction inside of an OR team, inside of a hospital, inside of a government, all come into play. Because Viktor Frankl is one of my heroes, wrote Man's Search for Meaning. If you haven't read, read that, one of the most incredible reads of all time. The greatest of all freedoms is the freedom to choose. So as you walk out of this conference, one of the key components we want you to come away with is you get the choice to decide what you're going to do with the information you gain. You get the choice to decide what you're going to make of it. And we're, we're going to make the chase, choice either consciously or unconsciously. And so our passion is allowing you to make it consciously. Because then that leads you to see things for how they can be. How do you want to drive the future? You know, why does purpose matter so much? Why is it such a big deal? Dennis talked about I get to spend some time with the dolphins. It's fascinating because completely different body types from a corner that has to be able to take on a pulling guard or run four flat with a wide receiver to the offensive lineman with, you know, the 6'6", 350 pounds. You know, purpose transforms that group of free agents into a cohesive and orderly line team aligned around a shared set of goals. The ultimate purpose is the first thing that it requires for everything because it creates identity. I live in Silicon Valley now, and I love working with entrepreneurs. There's only one moment you have a complete alignment ever, right? Entrepreneur has an idea. Surgeon has a new idea for an, a new procedure, right? There's, the moment you have the idea, it's perfect. But then all of a sudden, if you want to scale it, you have to bring in an organization. So you have an organizational goal. You have a team goal. You have an individual goal. Now, I've been on a lot of government teams that look like this. And you're all way better at math than me. Net some of those vectors is zero. Right? And you're never going to have perfect alignment, but if we can get those closer, that's where all of a sudden you get to the point where you get the sum being the greater than its parts. Right? Because every single time I ask any Navy SEAL to go downrange, any time I hire anyone on my team now, the individual has to see how they can meet their purpose inside the organization's purpose. Why do SEALs give their lives for their friends? It's not because they don't care about them. It's because we know there's a greater chance of individual survival by functioning as a team. You know, and that's where the world changes. As I talked to you about earlier about the conflict we had interagency before we even looked externally before and when, when we had our tactical objectives. The moment we changed and said, hey, what are we here for? We're here to defend freedom. We're here to stop the loss of more life. The moment that that shifted, we had complete alignment and we now had an ability in a context to make every decision. 
That's how he went from 18 to 300. That's how we learn to align with most, the most different type of people on the planet. You know, and this is why I do what I do now. If I get to speak with enough and share with enough of the world's greatest leaders, then, then we get to move to the proactive side of infinity where we're creating possibility instead of reacting to it. Thank goodness they look like their mother. Because a lot of you have talked about we'd love to have the, the power of an aligned SEAL team. We'd love to be able to change and move the alignment that the SEALs must have had. And the key is that you have it. Right? Because every single day you have the same outcome we wanted. You want to get a result. But a result comes from one thing, an action. You have to take the action to get the result. That action comes from one thing, right? It's a commitment, a desire to, to commit to make change. And the commitment at the leadership level that you're all at comes from the conversations. So the conversations you do or don't have in the next five days, the conversations you do or don't have amongst your teams are the components that are going to drive the results you do or do not get. And the key component for that is trust. You know, the conversations you will have will be reflected by the amount of trust you have. Because it really all comes down to relationships. Last night I got to sit in an extraordinary dinner where you saw you know, the net sum of your experiences not, is not necessarily the trophies or the awards, and many of you have millions of those, but it's the relationships you built. You have one of the last apprenticeship cultures, and it's looking at the, at the, the fellows and the, and the interns and, and the people you leave behind that you've trained to carry out the work that you've learned. And people say, well, the SEALs must have been made of teams of perfect people. But this is a people, you know, they're supposed to be out training on the range, but instead they're throwing smoke bombs. I'm suspect number four over on the right. So you have never been a part of any team of perfect people, but have been a part of nearly perfect teams. Because the great part about a team is that the strength of one person becomes the strength of the whole team. And each of our weaknesses are compensated for by the other strengths. So here's my life on a page. Leaders go first. Why does this matter? Well, the only reason I show you this is because if you can talk about anything in green, then you own me, all my successes. If you can help me with anything in red, any of the crises, then now you, you own me as well because you can help me. Right? You see over there, high school valedictorian, congratulations, tiny farm town, one of one. I was the best and the worst. Right? And then I went to the Naval Academy, and all of a sudden they said, hey, Think about home, you're not going to make it here. Well, I couldn't have told you what that crisis meant to me, but the crisis was, well, if some people say I'm good and some people say I'm bad, then I'm going to get rid of external standards. You may not know a lot about the SEAL community, but you see one of my high points, graduated from training at SEAL Team 6. Now I thought I was 10 feet tall and bulletproof, unstoppable. Two months later, I was getting ready for my first deployment. I was running late for a meeting with my wife. She was going to it was a, a fellowship event. I jumped down the stairs of our house, 13 deployments in combat, never injured, and I shattered my ankle. And the rumor at the command was that Kurt did it on purpose because he's a coward. Now, you may not know a lot about our branding, but that's not a good brand for a SEAL. And I could have quit right there. Right? And the reason I show you this is because the darkest moments, I never waste a good crisis. Crisis is the Chinese character for danger and opportunity. And for it weren't for that crisis, 45 days, I got operated on uh, two days later, and I was back in the field in Iraq 45 days later, which led me to be able to go into Yemen, which I'm going to talk a little bit about, which led me to be in front of you today. Right? I had a choice. You know, in moments of choice, you only have three things. You can either self-sabotage, which is guaranteed failure, status quo, which in a changing world is almost failure, and then take the leap of faith. Because every time you can take the leap of faith, you never get to see where it's going to go. And you may have patients, you may have bosses, you may have people that look a lot like this. We'll call this uh, Hendo for the, to protect the guilty. My first conversation is my brand new troop commander. They've all been on hundreds of operations. I've only been on two. I said, hey guys, today we're going to Dugway. We're going to do the most exciting training. We're, I need you to get this, this, and this ready. I came back at the end of the day. I said, how did we do? They said, we didn't do any of it. Hendo didn't want to. Now intuitively, you know, I was the boss, so I could have said, hey, do what I say. And most time, we tend to think of energy as conflict. And so I could have told him to do what I say, and he could have fought with me, and likely that would have worked out very poorly for me. So instead, I tried something different. I said, Hendo, do you think you can kick my butt? He said, absolutely. I said, okay, so can everybody else. So you don't have any intellectual advantage. I said, however, I'm as good at leading as you are driving tactics, so if we work together, we're going to take this troop amazing places. And if we don't align now, 
we may align next to a bunch of caskets in 90 days. So instead of fighting with him, I aligned with him. and He became the greatest ally and enabled some of the greatest victories we've ever had. Which brings us to part three, make things as they see them. Right? The thing that is surgeons, you're absolutely extraordinary about it, manifesting the, the, the possibility you see. Right? And this slide's the SEAL community on a slide. If you said, what makes us the best on the planet, it's this slide. Because when I do a room entry, if I go, boom, if I go left, I have a 45 degree arc of fire, it's all that matters in life. Because if I don't clear that threat, I know my buddy who goes in and goes right is never going to look back. So you're, again, you're better at math than me, 360 into 45. I have an 8x mathematical advantage on the enemy. Hundreds of room entries, dozens of deployments, we can win every single time against someone functioning as an individual. On the counter, though, the moment I enter a room and I don't trust the person behind me, and I try and take on the entire room, no matter how much training, we call it the fatal funnel, because there's no way I can possibly react to a new environment with someone that's, that's in a, their home environment and win. And I find business, and I find phys physicians, and I find life to be the exact same. Your decision as to whether you're going to function as a team or function as an individual will directly impact whether or not you can make the impact you'd like to drive. Because this is a picture of that same team in, in Iraq as we got ready for that deployment. In the end, you'll always do more for others than you will for yourself. And so as we got into that deployment, I'd, I'd flown, I'd finished training, got my ankle repaired, flew to Afghanistan, and then flew straight over to Iraq. Now, if you remember in 2005, this is the first time we had a lot of improvised explosive devices. Right? So they were all coming here out of Syria, and they were coming down the Euphrates River Valley. And so what happened was we had hundreds of thousands of troops along the, along the Euphrates River Valley, but the common belief was that the enemy was 10 feet tall and bulletproof. The belief was if you left the base that you, you couldn't win. And so what had happened was now you had all these troops, all these Bradleys, tanks, all this amazing machinery, all these amazing capabilities, but no one would leave because the belief was different. And so General Stan McChrystal took 150 of us and threw us out here in the middle of nowhere in Al-Assad. You got that great guidance that you may get as you're on the cutting edge of technology. See what you can do, kid. You ever hear that guidance? Right? See what you can create. See what you can drive. And so every single night, this is a picture taken from night vision, we'd fly into one of the Ford operating bases and we'd say, hey, can you go with us tonight? Can you help us go after the enemy? And every single time they'd say, no. We can't do it because, again, the belief was the enemy's unbeatable. So we'd fly off into the darkness. We'd fly five to ten kilometers off. So the helicopters didn't compromise. So we'd walk into the target, capture the enemy, bring them back to the Ford operating base, and drop them off. So we'll be back tomorrow night. And never more than three operations than did the Ford operating base leader would say, we got it. So over the course of 90 days, we went through every Ford operating base, every city, every village, and we did almost nothing. You know, do the math. We did maybe 120 operations. All the troops at those bases did the thousands of operations required. If you remember from 2000, uh, the spring into fall of 2007, they said the West has gone from lost to the West was the model province. Now, I studied na chemistry at the Naval Academy. I didn't use it much for explosives, but one of the key components I took away from it was the, the nature of a catalyst. Catalyst is not absorbed in the transaction. And it allows for change to continue. We obviously don't have all the surgeons in the world here, nor all your teams. But the goal is you get to decide today, do you want to be the catalyst that drives change? Do you want to be the catalyst that drives the future? Because if you're sitting in this conference here in, in 2017, 12 months from now, will you be talking about the changes and innovations that you've driven that you took away from here and executed on? Or are you talking about the things that could have been? This is really the key time where you get to decide, is my favorite quote from Gandhi, you get to be the change you wish to see in the world, the change you wish to see in your society, and the change you wish to see in each of your patients. Thank you for your time today.
every time I speak to Kurt, he starts by addressing me as sir. He doesn't even, doesn't even call me doctor, he calls me sir. So for the one opportunity, I get to return that favor and say, sir, that was truly outstanding. And I can't thank you enough for taking the time from your busy life and career, from your family, and spend time with us and, and, and really provide just a tremendously insightful lecture. For all of Kurt's talents, he recently proved to me that, that probably the thing he's best at is barter. So he and his wife were living in the East Coast. That's where he worked. She had completed an allergy fellowship at the University of Virginia. And like a lot of women, she was desperate to move back to California to be close to her mom, have help with the kids. And he said, okay, honey, well, I'll make you a deal. We'll move back to California as long as we can have our fourth child. And his wife is now expecting their fourth child. So I wish you all the best. I need to thank both of you, both, both Kurt and Ashok, for just being extraordinary lecturers today and really honoring me with the privilege of being here today. I hope you all enjoy the conference. I know we're off to a great start. Thank you.